we have arrived yet again. Last week was all about fireworks linked to U.S. economic data feeding Fed rate cut speculation. And that's exactly where we have once again returned. This is Macro Money. I'm Elias Spivak, head of Global Macro here at Tasty Live. And we are going to focus today, shock of shocks, on U.S. inflation data that is coming up here in less than 24 hours. Because once again, it will inform that very conversation. So what we are looking at here then uh, will be initially a look at why this stuff matters. There is, of course, as ever, some debate as to whether there is, in fact, a uh, level of significance to this information uh, relative to market outcomes. We'll confirm that here uh, in just a second, and then take a look at what the numbers might actually do for stocks and for other major assets. So let's uh, kick off with that little bit of stage setting. So this is uh, a chart uh, that viewers of Macro Money will be very intimately familiar with. This is um, the outlook for Fed rate cuts this year in the gray, next year in the yellow, the sum in orange, and in the blue, of course, the S&P 500 as a measure of overall market sentiment. And you can see here with the naked eye that initially, when we start having this conversation last year in late October, early November, as the Fed signals it has done hiking rates, there is an inverse relationship between policy expectations and Fed uh, implications for the market. So as you get more rate cuts, stocks get happier and go up. It flips at the turn of the year, where fewer rate cuts, nevertheless, are consistent with rising markets. It flips again right around late uh, April, second half of April, early May, where more rate cuts means stocks are higher. And then it flips again in July, where more rate cuts sees stocks go lower, both here, of course, and here. So the temptation is to say that really there is no relationship here, that one thing is doing one thing and the other is doing the other. But to think that would be to miss the obvious economic data backdrop influencing these relationships. Correlations don't hold ironclad forever. That's almost never the case. Correlations wax and wane, especially when we're talking about near-term expectations, because what the markets are doing simultaneously is assessing what the Fed is likely to do and assessing the business cycle and the economy and seeing where the disconnect between those two might be, because, of course, that's where there is speculative interest. If the markets perceive mispricing, if they think the Fed is either late or early, or the economy is somehow developing not in line with what Fed policy expectations are, that's where there is tradable opportunity. And so to miss the economic data overlay to how these relationships are changing, is to miss most of what's actually occurring. Now consider this. This is a uh, Citigroup index that measures U.S. economic data outcomes relative to expectations. And what I've marked off in the red here are important inflection points in the S&P 500 as relative to important inflection points in the data. Notice, we have right here the beginnings of the rally. Here's October of last year. This is that big turn in stock markets. What do we see here? As things get more dovish in the expectations, stocks rally because what's happening in the economic data, it's deteriorating. 
relative to expectations. In other words, the markets see bad data, get the signal from the Fed that it is actually ready to act on it, start to bake out cuts, and are encouraged that the Fed is in fact on the case, that it has recognized that for the first time in a while, the trend in data outcomes has turned. By definition, of course, a trend higher is a series of higher highs and higher lows. So we can see here from mid-2022, the data is tending increasingly to outperform relative to forecasts. And in October, it pointedly turns and violates the bounds of this advance, which is to say there is a turn in the business cycle being hinted here toward a weaker economy at least relative to expectations, if not in absolute terms. So when the markets get the news that things are turning down, they bake in more cuts, and this is not bad news because it's telling them the Fed is on the case. It's coming to the rescue. Then there's the start of the year, and the data starts getting better. Not surprisingly, cuts start going away. But they're not going away for bad reasons because the economy is on th the mend. So yes, fewer cuts, but that's not bad news for stocks. They're cheering an economy that's improving. And then we get to the middle of April, where we start to get data deteriorating much more dramatically than it did here. Notice we're above zero on this surprise index, which means we're still surprising higher just by a smaller quotient. Whereas here, we've actually gone below zero, and now data is tending to disappoint. What do we see from market expectations? They again start to build out more easing, and the markets ostensibly like this because the argument from the Fed is we don't need to cut now, the economy can sustain higher rates. We need to make sure inflation is good and beaten. But the markets are suspecting, yeah, that's maybe so, but you're going to be late, and that means you'll need to cut much more next year. As the economy starts to actually show, from the Fed's own perspective, some signs of wear and tear, which happens in July, right here, we see that the relationship locks back in. Once the Fed actually signals that the cuts are imminent, the markets go, ah, we've been speculating since mid-April that you're going to be behind the curve. Now you've recognized that it's time to go. We don't interpret this as good news. We interpret this as you having seen the weakness we've been worried about. And now your plans to cut are a signal that you too see weakness and an urgency to act. And that means that whatever risks face the business cycle are mounting. We can see then, of course, since the beginning of July, stocks go down as things get more dovish. Things anchor as the markets have their little seesaw moment from the August 5th spike lows. We ultimately do not retake July's highs and easing expectations just keep growing as stocks skid down. That the markets fear the Fed is late is relatively evident here in their expectation that the probability of a double-sized 50 basis point cut next week when the Fed ostensibly kicks off the cycle is still close to 30%, which is very elevated. We're still looking at a very significant chance in the, mar in the market's own baseline here that the Fed is going to admit to having missed an opportunity in July, that they're going to come out and say, we should have cut at July's meeting, so now we're going to cut by 50 because we're behind the ball. That the market is assigning a 33% likelihood to that outcome suggests they already see the Fed as behind. And that's a starting point condition for everything that we see next. You can see that even more overtly in the way that 
policy expectations have evolved since that spike on August 5th. Obviously, uh, the markets were building into that spike. The August 2nd jobs report was the stage setting ahead of uh, that number, the disappointing PMI results that got us careening lower from uh, the sort of quiet of the Fed's July 31st announcement, which was right here. That's what gave us this shock low. Notice, from then until now, the outlook for Fed rate cuts this year is yet to rebuild to panic levels. It has rebuilt. So at the height of the turmoil, we were looking at 104 basis points in cuts this year. That's ostensibly the market's measure of, oh, no, emergency. We've since narrowed to 75, come back to 91 as the markets have come back down again. So we've yet to reclaim panic levels. But look at what's happened to 2025. Not only are we through the panic levels, but by a significant margin. During the panic, 105 basis points baked in for next year, now 136, giving us a cumulative tally that is adding an entire additional rate cut. We've gone from about 200 basis points here, you can see 105 and 104, so about 209, call it right here, to 227, which is to say we've gone from expecting 200 po uh, basis points or 2% in cuts for the cycle through next year to two and a quarter. We've added another whole cut for next year. That isn't because the markets think the Fed is doing the right thing by waiting now. It's because they, ex they expect for them to scramble faster next year, which is to say, again, as a baseline condition going into this inflation data in front of us over the next day, the market already fears the Fed is late to begin rate cuts. Now, what do we expect from the economic data? The expectation here is that the headline number will come down to 2.6% year on year. That would be the lowest since March of 2021. The headline number of uh, is not the primary focus, of course, because the Fed can do relatively little to influence the global cost of energy and food. And we can uh, clearly see here that almost all inflation at this point is baked into the service sector. Goods inflation is actually negative and is pulling inflation lower. That's an interesting measure of uh, economic uh, resilience given uh, the demand structure in and of itself. But that aside, the Fed is focused clearly on that poor reading because that's where services inflation X energy X food lives. And that number is expected to hold unchanged at 3.2%. That's still a three-year low, just the same one that we hit in July. Now, the Cleveland Fed's modeling, which the market looks at very closely, that anticipates what CPI will be with incoming uh, economic data, so-called nowcast, offers us an interesting window into what might look like the degree of surprise risk. So if we look at what's been happening since April of this year, we can see on the headline, realized results, the darker bars, versus the model expectations, the yellow bars, have followed a clear pattern whereby the model, again in the yellow, has been overstating inflation for four consecutive months. 
where realized results have come in a bit lighter. The same thing generally holds for the core. In April, they were about the same, but from there, three consecutive months where the model in the green has been overstating what then ultimately occurs in the realized numbers in the red. Now, that would seemingly tilt us in the direction of a slight downward bias relative to what uh, these numbers might be when they actually come out. Having said that, it is not a uniform set of foreshadowing coming from the leading economic data, because if we look at the latest set of ISM economic activity surveys, which of course contain a prices component, we can see that in August, there's actually a bit of a quickening in the pace of price growth, both for the manufacturing and the service sectors. And in so much as the economy is overwhelmingly dominated by the service sector, and most inflation lives in the service sector, as we just saw, this is that massive area right here, it bears paying attention in particular to what's happening in this service sector story. In fact, if we overlay that service sector gauge, that's this right here, and put against it the CPPI numbers, as well as the Fed's favored PCE inflation gauge, with about a two-month lag, we can see that there's fairly good sequencing here. And that, of course, seems to imply that there's some degree of anchoring in near-term inflation. And the slowdown that you see in the ISM numbers mirrors generally what you've seen in the pace of disinflation for the headline figures. So maybe we get a slightly lighter number, but by no means are we looking for a sharp surprise on the downside. Forward-looking indications seem to suggest we're not going anywhere fast from here, even if the drift lower generally seems to continue. Does that perhaps threaten the probability of any Fed rate cut? And the short answer is no. Because if you look at the Fed's higher frequency measures, they often talk about looking at the three-month annualized rate of change in inflation, the six-month rate, not just the year-on-year -year rate that they target, because this gives them a sense of the nearer-term dynamics and where things might be starting to turn or trend. And what you see here is comparing the three-month annualized numbers, both for core and headline CPI, you can see that they are uniformly slowing, even if, as uh, in July, the actual numbers tick a bit higher. So you can see in July, month-on-month -month CPI actually had a slightly larger rise than this um, decline that we saw uh, in the headline uh, and the almost decline, certainly a very small increase that we saw in the core. There's been clearly a rebound from that, but nevertheless, we can see the three-month headline numbers annualized are heading lower. Six-month ones for the headline, same thing. The red bars are getting progressively shorter yellow bars are getting progressively shorter, green bars are getting progressively shorter, which is to say the headline and the core at their higher frequency rates of change annualized are telling the Fed inflation is consistently cooling, is on a path to continue to do so, and so issuing a cut makes sense. What this suggests is that, it, is that whatever cooling that there is, despite the possibility for downside surprise risk that we see here, is unlikely to be dramatic. And that puts us largely right back here. If we are in a state 
here where what we are anticipating is that we are going to see a situation where the Fed is not in a position to appear clear in its intention. If we get to a situation where this kind of ambiguity is locked in, then the markets are not left very encouraged because they still have to operate with the same baseline. In simple terms, what this means is that were we to get a much weaker CPI number, the markets would go, ah, well, the Fed's going to do the 50 basis points. They're going to say, look, we need it to go faster. And here we are. We've done that. So the markets can feel confident that at least the Fed is on the case. And that would give a sense of a sense of relief, perhaps. If CPI were to come in a little bit warmer, the markets might say, ah, well, we don't need a 50 basis point rate cut. The economy is fine. Everything is generally okay here. The Fed is not in a hurry. And if that were to be the case, then you might look at this situation and say, okay, yes, the Fed is going to do the 25, but there's no emergency here. There is no need to do anything especially dramatic. And then the market might be okay with that outcome. But the tea leaves seem to be lining up to suggest that what we're going to get is something that's relatively close to forecasts. And that would leave this ambiguity in place. And if the baseline is, as we can see right here, that the market already thinks the Fed might be behind the curve, then ambiguity is a bad thing, especially left unresolved with nothing else to really go on until the Fed policy announcement next week. And that might well be negative for, for stock markets, if only because they might be encouraged to de-risk having become no more convinced that either the economy is developing in line with the Fed's slow walk of stimulus, or the Fed is adjusting its pace for an economy running away from it. If ambiguity around these two variables and the interplay between them continues, then stocks look vulnerable to further losses, and the U.S. dollar may well rise, perhaps not even only because there is less likelihood of a 50 basis point move or more, but because with risk aversion comes cashing out and the most liquid form of cash still remains the U.S. dollar. So defensive markets will tend to cash out that way, and of course into the yen as well with some unwinding of carry exposure still on the board. Needless to say, that kind of a defensive uh, stance would also bode ill for the likes of crude oil, which continues to sink, and, and other cyclical assets and sentiment-sensitive assets, whereas bonds, especially at the long end, might look relatively attractive and benefit if only because there is a risk off tilt, and they tend to be a, a beneficiary of those conditions, and of course also because any sense that the Fed might be likelier to slow walk now means that more cuts show up next year, still more than there is already. And that is macro money for today.
as ever, uh, we are here Monday through Thursday, right after overtime, a show that I co-host with Chris Vecchio and Dylan Radigan, looking at the Wall Street close and where things might go there from. I'm on with Victor Jones for The Price of Truth on Wednesdays, on with Chris again on Futures Power Hour Fridays, on with Victor and Tom for First Call Sundays, writing for the news and insights portion of TastyLive.com, and opining sporadically on the platform formerly known as Twitter, at Ilya Spivak. Thanks very much for joining. Good luck out there. Macro Money's back tomorrow.